No, you're, you're on point, man. $70,000 for a Nautilus is just stupid. Well, I would, but he says he doesn't do live videos. Oh, hey! Welcome to Weekend Watches. My friend and I were just having an animated discussion. Turn up the volume because this morning, Swiss heavy metal takes the stage. I recommend Crocus. Oath K, this morning, what do we have? Let's start with a wrist check real quick because you guys know the watch. And if you're absolutely new to the program, then you're new to this watch. My Zin Easy M11, 43 millimeters tegmented steel, radial chronograph display, 60 minute style. This is a tribute watch from 2017 in honor of the 1997 Easy M1 made for the German Federal Customs Service Enforcement Division by Zin of Frankfurt. But that said, you know that watch. All of these are making their debut. Why don't we start with my friend over here? Because before you so rudely interrupted our discussion, I was talking to MBNF's 50-piece limited edition, Balthazar. Balthazar is a collaboration with Lepe, 1839, and he is essentially a fusion of MBNF childlike imagination with the precision of a fine Swiss clock. Now, a few things will stand out. First, like a good politician, he's two-faced. If you get real close to his head, you can see that the balance and the escapement, beaten away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, they are actually housed in his cranium. Underneath that chrome dome, you can see that his eyes on his smiley side are actually 20-second retrogrades. Moving down, you'll appreciate the jump hour and the scrolling minutes, and closer to his waist, his utility belt, if you will, there is a power reserve for the mechanism. Now, you can see the flanking four mainspring barrels that are the energy sources for this 405-piece movement by Lepe, but you'll also note that the 35-day power reserve is marked by a radial power reserve indicator. Now, what appears to be his shield, and there are four different versions, this is the silver version, is actually a key. The better to wind on the reverse side. You set the time by inserting the key into the winding, or I should say the setting train. The winding train is located adjacent to the mainspring barrels. You'll also appreciate that there is a moon phase with a 29 and a half day cycle right down on his waist and he is completely articulated. So if you're a fan of Bender from Futurama and you have 50 grand to drop on a clock, I can't think of a more logical way to spend your discretionary cash. And again, a 50 piece limited series, if you want a sense of scale, we'll zoom out again. He is approximately, well, I think the scientific term is yay large. No. Precisely, he is just under 40 centimeters tall, and he weighs an unfathomable 8.2 kilograms, or over 18 pounds imperial. Now, he's also fully posable. As you can see, I'm able to articulate his limbs, and even the individual digits of his clasper fingers. So the timepiece, of course, and I do call it a timepiece because this is not a watch, might be the most fun you can have with the adult playpen, and this truly is a toy for big boys. By the way, Balthazar, an excellent conversationalist. You just have to speak his language. He speaks in ones and zeros, but not twos. All right, jumping into the table this evening, let's talk about a watch that's over the top. Not that over the top, but by the standards of the wrist. Launched for 2017, 70-piece limited edition. This is the Hublot Ferrari Tech Frame Tourbillon. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is unscrew the quarter turn crown and move that offending minute hand out of the way. This is a mono pusher, five day power reserve, Ferrari designed Hublot Tourbillon watch. Now what makes it Ferrari designed? Well, Ferrari's Centro Stile actually designed the watch and then Hublot realized the construction, the engineering and the finishing. Now the timepiece, which features a wonderful quarter turn crown as you can see, includes what, for all intents and purposes, is a flying tourbillon. Let's get super close, Andrew. I'll hold it steady. The tourbillon beats away at 21.6, and it has an invisible upper bridge. You can see the central pivot. It's embedded in a sapphire upper bridge, so you have full visual access to the black polished tourbillon carriage. Now, immediately adjacent, you can actually see the lateral clutch of the chronograph. The column wheel is exposed at the top of the dial. The lateral clutch is exposed at the bottom, and as you can see, 
It runs directly off the tourbillon when it's in action, with a scrolling seconds display adjacent to what would conventionally be 3 o'clock on the dial, and then you have chronograph minutes jumping up at what would conventionally be 11. Incredible depth to the dial. You can see the watch has three primary components. The first is a full sapphire casing that encircles the movement and the dial, and you can see the dial features multiple layers of finishes, materials, textures, and tones. Then you have a lattice work. This is the tech frame, as designed by Ferrari, a combination of grade 5 titanium and 750 or 18 karat white gold. Now we're going to open up the clasp and in fact I need not open it up to display the wares because it has a quick release system for the strap and that's the Hublot HUB 6311 manual wind, fully skeletonized, five-day power reserve, 27 jewels fully adjusted, and you can see this is a limited edition of 70 pieces created in 2017 to celebrate 70 years of Ferrari cars. Now, of course, we had the 70th anniversary Scuderia Ferrari Gerard Perigo on a recent program, and you might be asking, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, the Gerard Perigo celebrated 70 years of Scuderia Ferrari, the racing team, which predates Ferrari, the road car manufacturer, as Enzo Ferrari was originally the factory Alfa Romeo race campaigner. So this is a timepiece that's dedicated to the Ferrari we know today. Ultra high tech, a fusion of man and machine, and quite simply unlike anything else out there. It's 45 millimeters in diameter, about 15.5 millimeters thick, and it spans the wrist at 59 millimeters lug to lug. 59 millimeters is huge, but the shape of the case mitigates against fit problems because you can see it's actually curved at its ends to arc around the wrist. That is quite simple simply proof that Hublot is a real manufacturer, not just of luxury horology, but of high horology. With hand finish and hand adjustment, Hublot has truly arrived. And again, it's a mono pusher chrono. Okay, that's a tough act to follow, but we're going to go with the crowd pleaser, a watch that's probably the best bang for the buck in the dive segment, rivaled only by the Carl F. Bucher or Petravi Scuba Tech. This is the far more wearable 42 millimeter Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Now this is a watch that came out last year at Basel World, the 25th anniversary Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Originally a 41 millimeter watch launched in 1993 and catapulted to fame in 1995 as the wrist armor of 007, Pierce Brosnan in Goldeneye at the time. The watch is now a 42 with a laser ablated wave style ceramic dial, ceramic insert in the bezel, you have cold enamel fills for the indices and the numerals. The watch is 37, or I should say 13.7 millimeters thick, and a big difference on this watch, and this really does make quite a difference for those who love to see that for which you've paid. There's now a standard sapphire display cap on the reverse side of the case. It's a 55 hour power reserve, an amagnetic movement, and it is a coaxial Matas chronometer that's been through the Matas test, which is a test of the fully cased watch, not just chronometry in six positions, but water resistance, power reserve, winding efficiency, and anti-magnetism. Other upgrades include a new dual mode clasp. If you look inside the clasp, which has always been machined for these, not stamped, features a push-button slider for incremental adjustments, but also an all-or-nothing fold-out clasp, so you get quite a good deal of adjustment, just over 40 millimeters total. Throwing it on the wrist, you can see it still wears a charm. Although it is larger than the 41 millimeter watch, it is actually the same distance across the wrist or less, because now you can see that the end links of the bracelet are pivoted, meaning it actually has a shorter lug-to-lug -lug or link to link span than the original 41 millimeter watch and I absolutely adore it. This is still a great value. For under $4,000 pre-owned on the full bracelet, you cannot do better. That said, you can find a more exclusive Omega Seamaster. And I'm going to highlight my personal favorite of the Omega Seamaster chronos. This is the 2003 Omega Seamaster Apnea, a special edition designed in conjunction with record-breaking freediver Jacques Mayol. The timepiece features, as you can see, a set of individual, seven specifically, apertures, which fill one half an aperture each minute. So they turn red and then they turn black. 
two minutes per aperture, 14 minutes total, and you can see the aperture beginning to turn red. It's the duration approximating the maximum hypothetical free dive duration of a human being. And again, this was designed as an apnea diving tool by Jacques Mayol. You'll note a few unusual refinements other than the unique chronograph display system. First, the hands, only ever used on this model and its silver dialed counterpart. There are two versions of this watch, but only two versions. So the hands are unique. The dial is matte finished, and as you can see, there are all applique indices. This was unusual by the standards of early 2000s Omegas, usually printed dials back then. You'll also note that the bezel is satin finished and lacquer filled. So this is not an anodized aluminum insert. Instead, it is buff metal with lacquer inserts to provide the distinctions. Now, the watch is still a 41 millimeter, and when you throw it on the wrist, you see its largest dimension is actually thickness, 16.5. You can see the name and the chosen symbol of Jacques Mayol on the reverse side, and this is a caliber 3601, which is a modular chronograph custom made for Omega, built on an ETA 2892A2 base. So throw this one on the wrist, and you can see that it wears easily, although it is a chunk. Now, I mentioned that this watch, 41 millimeters, is broader link to link than the later 42 millimeter watch, and you can see at almost 53 millimeters across the wrist, it is a bigger timepiece. Don't think of it as a 41, think of it as a 43, and it has one of the chunkiest and most satisfying Omega bezels of the 2000s, and I'm going to prove that right now. By the way, you can see the progress of the apnea chronograph with its unique bow-shaped skeletonized red varnished seconds hand. The apertures are filling up. I'm going to roll this one over to the mic and let you hear the bezel. For comparison's sake, we'll bring the new watch in. I like the old one better, I'll be honest. That said, you do have your options if you are into exotic divers, because they don't come much more exotic than a three-year only 40 millimeter stainless steel modern Rolex reference, and that's exactly what we have here. With the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Sea Dweller, this is the 116600, better known as the Sea Dweller 4K or Sea Dweller 4000. Now, it launched in 2014. It was dead by the arrival of the 50th anniversary Sea Dweller in 2017, and the only bum wrap against this watch is that it looked too much like the sub, but does it really? You have an absence of Cyclops eye creating a beautifully symmetrical and unmarred dial, a clean case profile that's only slightly thicker than a sub. Now it's a 15, which means it's just under two and a half millimeters thicker than the sub, but easily viable on a smaller wrist. This is a rare watch. It still has all of the underlying virtues of a sea dweller. Helium escape valve, greater diving depth, a thicker sapphire, and of course, because of the absence of the Cyclops, thanks to that thicker sapphire, a cleaner dial. On my wrist, it wears easily. And I should mention that you do get a few toys for your price premium. Back in the day, this cost about $2,000 more than a standard sub. You get the glide lock incremental adjustment system, 20 millimeters of adjustment in two millimeter increments, but unlike the sub, which has that feature, you get a full flip lock fold out clasp. So you get over 50 millimeters of total extension. That is a trick that no Submariner can match. And you'll even note that the inside of the clasp was distinctively finished, alternately blasted and polished. This is a very special watch. For those just joining us, or those who might be new to the program, my wrist is 16 centimeters circumference if you want a sense of the scale of these watches. Let's go high horology real quick. Let's talk about something completely distinct from anything else we've had on the show. Haute Lance is Haute Lance, and it is difficult to describe a brand whose name means nothing other than being an anagram for Neuchâtel, where the company is based. Now, this is a timepiece, 44 millimeters, that represents the HL... C series, so circular, but this is the HLQ8, which is the HL with the circular case, but with the Contiem. So it has a pusher at the top of the case that will rapidly change the date. And then it features the spring-loaded ruby roller swing arm system and jump hour for the retrograde minutes and the Jump Hour system. So this is a independent brand that is actually a sister company to Moser. They're owned by the same MELB Holdings. So the company that owns Haute Lance is larger than Haute Lance and thus able to service the watch and provide parts support forever and ever. 44 millimeters, but it doesn't wear that large, just under 12 millimeters thick. The watch is rather impressive, but also rather slender. And you can see on the reverse side, this is the caliber HLQ, 
And of course, with the 21 6 beat rate, 40 hour manually wound power reserve, and handsome true high horology finish, you could sort of see the Coke de Genève and their ridged gradient, along with the mirrored anglage lighting up on the edge of every bridge. This is a hand finished movement. You'll also note, if you've got an eagle eye, that this is a limited edition of 88 pieces, and thus a very rare watch, even by the standards of Haute Lance. And they make it easy to swap straps with these pull tab strap release spring bars. Throw it on the wrist, and you can see that the watch, which is titanium and quite light, is easy to accommodate in spite of its large size. Now, it's under 50 millimeters lug to lug at about 49, so I can wear it easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It is a very animated timepiece, and if you love independence, especially independence that only make a few hundred watches per year, this watch is going to be right in your wheelhouse. You do need a little bit of a sense of humor to buy a brand outside of the nomenclatura of mainstream independence, but this one will reward your confidence with reliability and a sense of fun that's tangible in the same way that my friend here is tangibly fun. This feels like a watch that MBNF could have created. Oh right, jumping to a watch that represents a crowd pleaser at an accessible price. I don't think you can buy a better watch pre-owned for under six grand, but back in 2015, I don't think I was more taken by any new Jaeger Le Coult timepiece than this 39 millimeter black sunburst dial master control. You can see the hands are half frosted to increase the legibility on a black dial. That's always a problem with polished hands on black dials, but JLC nips that in the bud with the contrast. You have tri-Arabics, you have diamond polished individual dart indices, fully loomed, and that is distinct from the sector dial version of this watch, which is not fully loomed. Another distinction between the sector dial version and this deluxe model is the use of a full deployant clasp. Getting a little bit close to the case back, you can see it is handsomely executed with a full rose gold rotor, a free sprung balance for shock resistance, and you will appreciate that JLC uses real fire blued or fire annealed screws. These are not chemically dyed, these are the real deal fired in a kiln to create a thick essential oxidation that is one half the wavelength of yellow light, canceling out the yellow light and creating the blue tone that you see. Throwing this watch on the wrist, it is wonderfully agreeable. Slender, versatile, handsome, and all around watch. If it has any weakness, it's that it's 50 meters water resistant, which is great for a dress watch, but not quite enough that I would endorse swimming with the watch. Just over 10 millimeters thick, this is truly a lovely timepiece and a timeless design that will look just as good 50, 60, 70 years hence. I think JLC really nailed it with this black dial model in 2015, and I prefer it by far for its richness and its power to the crowd-pleasing sector dial that came two years later. So this would be my choice. That said, I can also peg the meter with JLC tonight. We do have quite a bit of it on the table. I want to emphasize that no one makes a more vocal minute repeating wristwatch than the folks from the Valet du Jeu. And no, Audemars Piguet, I'm not referring to your maison. Launched in 2005, this 200 piece limited edition JLC master minute repeater is the Ne Plus Ultra, or the Ne Plus Ultra, if we want to use our proper enunciation. All right, let's see that close up. Camera shot, please. The rack and snail, the strike barrel, the strikers. You could see that there's a little musical note triplet down at the base of the dial, and that is where the gongs are welded to the sapphire to create that resonance in spite of the dense 44 millimeter platinum case. So the timepiece opening up its dial to your view, it actually has three complications. The minute repeater, the power reserve, which spans over two weeks, 15 days, and then the torque meter assembly, which essentially tells you the health of the watch. And 
the amount of torque being issued by the mainspring barrels should always be high. So when the watch approaches the need for service, you'll know because the torque reading on the torque meter will be low. Turn it all over and you can see the caliber, which features two mainspring barrels, is built very much like a 19th century Valet de Jeu pocket watch. You have jewels set in chiton, the mainspring barrel pivots are set in screw fixed chiton, you have Maishor, because we're not in Germany, it's not German silver, but it's the same nickel copper zinc alloy. A three quarter style bridge like a pocket watch and then you can see a few modifications made for the sake of modernity. A full balance bridge to brace against shock and a free sprung index to take and hold a tight six position regulation. The movement has incredible finish with Cote de Soleil radiating out from the balance which beats away at 21.6 and you can see at the edge of the bridges at the root of the Cote de Soleil there is mirrored englage on every lateral surface. You can even see the hand engraved and inked signature of Antoine Lecoultre the founder of the Grand Maison, the great house of the Valet de Jeu. Throw it on the wrist, it's overpowering. No bones about it. 52.5 millimeters lug to lug, it'll fit on my wrist, but what this watch really wants is a 17 centimeter circumference wrist or larger. It is an incredible pleasure to wear this much platinum with this much hand finished complication. But I'll be honest, this is a watch that begs for an owner who plays NFL football, preferably offensive tackle. That is one hell of a machine. That, that is a machine that deserves its own Discovery Channel special. Extreme machines, call me. Okay, jumping into something by an independent once more, and one that's chronically underrated. We've featured Arnold and Son before, and we've featured the CTB Chronograph Truebeat, but we have not seen the steel version recently. And the steel version, as they say, is real. It's the one I would want, and I'm sure, as connoisseurs, it's the one to which you gravitate. Now, the watch features a dial that is triple finished. You have a satin finished metal, you have a frosted metal, and then you can see there is an opaline or very subtly grained finish for the hours, the minutes, as well as the center of the chronograph minutes display. Now you can see that the chronograph has sweep seconds, jump down to the minutes display, and the sweep seconds inform the minute counter. So this is your chronograph seconds hand. I'll stop it so you can tell the difference. The time of day is center seconds, rare enough on a chronograph, but it is a deadbeat second mechanism, whereas the chronograph seconds hand is a sweep system. So they have a sort of two-step do-si-do as they amble around a dial with incredible depth note. Now turn it all over and you can see the 44 millimeter stainless steel case, only 48.5 millimeters lug to lug with tightly downturned lugs. We'll do a wrist shot in a moment, but caliber 7103 is awesome. It uses the same Cote de Soleil or sunburst stripes that you see on the JLC, but emanating from a center point underneath the rotor. There is an oversized, cartoonishly oversized column wheel for the chrono, and it is a column wheel vertical clutch chronograph. So it is both crisp to actuate and very smooth to start. Plus if you wish, Thanks to the vertical clutch, you can leave the chronograph engaged full time. 45 hour automatic winding power reserve. Now you can see the bridges have an edge that is mirrored and broad. Broader than Patek Philippe, broader than Giger Lecoultre, broader than Vacheron. This is englage, mirrored beveling that you can see without a loop and enjoy. All the screw heads that are not blued are black polished. And this is a timepiece that gives you an incredible array of finishes, textures, tones, depth, and materials. Turn it back over, throw it on the wrist, and it's a surprisingly wearable 44. Unlike the JLC, which is a monstrous 44, this one is ergonomically shaped to work with a smaller wrist, and it all comes down to the lug shape, which you can see is both short and tightly curved. This was my favorite new watch of 2014, and it remains among my top three or four favorite chronograph timepieces. And Arnold & Son, which is the watch brand of mega manufacturer La Joux Pere, has citizen watch money to fund it and La Joux Pere engineering expertise, making it the best of both worlds. The Far Eastern giant providing the money and the Swiss providing the engineering, precision, design. And this watch, I'm gonna say, has a soul as a handmade, hand-decorated timepiece. That said, we have a watch that's perhaps a bit more conventional, if no less crowd-pleasing. This is the first time I've had the watch on the show, but it's from a famous family. Launched in 1953, the Blanc Pain 50 Fathoms was the first modern dive watch, beating the Rolex Submariner to market by a few months. In 2017, to celebrate 10 years of the modern reference 5015 50 Fathoms, we got the watch you see here. This is the 5015 
in titanium, blue dial, double finished with satin circular on the hour track and satin sunburst on the center, white gold quarter arabics as well as indices and hands. The timepiece is entirely satin finished, so if the standard 5015 in steel is just too glam rock for you, this one is grunge, satin finished with a lovely vertical striation rather than longitudinal. You can see that the Bars themselves are fixed by hex key screws, not spring bars for security. Now you still have the sapphire cambered cap on the bezel, so you have that lovely lush, almost dewdrop like effect. The bezel is fully loomed too, so you can see the entire bezel and the entire dial at night. Turn it over and another change from the standard 5015. You can see the hand finished 5 day power reserve automatic caliber 1315. So three mainspring barrels, five-day power reserve, automatic winding. It has both an amagnetic silicon hairspring and a free-sprung architecture. It's adjusted in six positions, one more than a chronometer. And objective tests have found that this watch, in multiple positions over several weeks, will run to one second per day. As with the Arnold & Son, you have big, fat, mirrored anglage that is easy to see, so you don't need a loop to appreciate the finish of this watch. The screw heads are black polished, and if you look carefully, you can see there's an un conventional finish on the bridges. It's a sort of satin spiral that emanates out from the, the center. It's more interesting and more original than Cote de Genève, and it perfectly matches the satin finish of the case itself. Throw the watch on the wrist and you appreciate what 50.6 millimeter lug-to-lug -lug means for fit on a smaller wrist. I would buy, own, and enjoy this watch without reservations. This is an easy watch to wear on a small wrist. 14 and a half centimeters, you're good to go. 50.6 millimeters lug-to-lug, -lug, but the lugs are short and stubby, and the watch, mostly of sapphire and titanium, is feather light on the wrist. Still 300 meters water resistant in spite of the display case back. This is the 50 Fathoms that I want and I would buy for myself. It's the one I recommend to you without reservation as my first choice among available divers. That said, we do have some quirky watches on the table tonight, and JLC comes up every time innovation is discussed. Back in 2005, JLC created a watch for those who want it all. Can you have a handmade watch that is also so shock resistant that you can engage in tennis, batting, firearms marksmanship, even pegging the bell at a carnival hammer throw. You better believe it. This is the Master Compressor Extreme World Chronograph, a vertical clutch column wheel twin mainspring barrel, 65 hour power reserve, 100 meter water resistant titanium and platinum hybrid limited edition of 200 pieces. Now you can see half the dial features a sapphire cover and that's part of the world time display. You can see that I'm able to change my reference city. Your reference city, Abu Dhabi for example, sits at six o'clock. Then you set the time at center and you make sure that the 24 hour reference sits adjacent to your reference city. Once both are correctly set, you have all 24 time zones visible simultaneously and you can see just how deep this dial is with a lovely black galvanized city ring and you could see at center a lovely sunburst argent slate gray with a disc system for reading the hours as well as a pointer red varnished hand that jumps, does not scroll, but jumps for the minutes. You have a constant seconds indicator down at six o'clock and the watch, which I will admit is overpowering in platinum and titanium at almost 47 millimeters. It's actually 46.7, but throw it on the wrist. And I can tell you, I owned the alarm version of this watch, the Master Compressor Extreme World Alarm. For eight years, I enjoyed that watch. And that was my watch you want beach cleanup watch every year when we did our charity event down at Miami Beach in Florida. And that was my only water resistant JLC. This watch does give you everything right down to the wearability, even on a smaller wrist. Do I recommend a bigger wrist than 16 centimeters? Yes. Is it wearable on my wrist size? Yes. The watch is full of features. It has two cases. It has one case, which is titanium. And you could see that case separated. On the flank, you can see the center case, which is titanium. It sits on shock absorbers to make the watch shock resistant. The outer case is black polished platinum. And then you have the crown for adjusting the world time reference ring. You also have a system based on JLC's compressor crowns that lets you lock or unlock with one quarter turn the chronograph mechanism. 
With one half turn, you can lock or unlock the crown. 100 meter water resistance in one turn, and no trouble manipulating these with wet, sweaty, or gloved hands because the compressor crown system that gives the watch its name is brilliantly easy to grip, even if your hands are slimy. Now, the watch has a cool case back, and you can see, individually numbered out of 200 pieces. It also features a unique quick release system. I'm going to see if I can demonstrate it to good effect here. But a unique quick release system so you can quickly and easily remove the straps from the case. And it takes any 22 millimeter strap, so you don't need a proprietary strap to use this quick release system. It simply withdraws the lugs and allows you to slide out any conventional spring bar. So you can use a standard strap on a quick release strap system. No need for proprietary straps. And proprietary straps have sort of ruined that system on Cartier, IWC, and Hublot. JLC doing it right. Now, let's talk about Rolex for a moment because I am not done with the crown brand. The crown prince of Swiss watchmaking launched perhaps the most interesting Cellini, to me at least, in 2016. No, I'm not talking about the moon phase. That came the next year. I'm talking about this. The Cellini date. What White gold with blue guilloche sunray dial. This is the most interesting Cellini because it's the most visceral to me. It tugs at my heartstrings. It has a date, it has an explosive multi-layer dial, and it has a universally wearable 39mm white gold case. Throw it on the wrist and you really appreciate what it means to have a sub 48mm lug-to-lug dimension. I can recommend this watch for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. And you can see you don't have to get super close to catch the action of that dial. It's still compelling even from half a room away. This is a watch that gives you Rolex build quality, Rolex precision, and a five-year Rolex warranty, but, but, you don't get the post-sale markup when the watch is used, and there's no wait list for it. And, even better, this is the Rolex no one in your office or club will own. So it has individuality, the rarest of traits in Rolex timepieces. That said, I'm also willing to say that no one in your office has a day date in full white gold. Not common, and a connoisseur's watch. Nevertheless, the so-called president, especially when featured on an oyster bracelet, is an uncommon sight. Now, this is a punchy Rolex president, 36 millimeters in white gold. This one is a P-series, so right back at the turn of the century, this is a millennial reference, appropriate for yours truly, as a representative of that lamentable generation. The timepiece is universally wearable because of its size, and it's universally appealing because of the power of that black galvanized dial. Now throw it on the wrist, and I'm going to show you that it still has a crown clasp. In spite of not having the Rolex President bracelet, the burlier, sportier oyster is here. You still get that distinctive crown clasp that shows you the partition point based exclusively on the position of the five-point coronet. Throw it on the wrist, and I have to tell you, Eyes closed, I'd swear it's a larger watch because it's so solid. Solid end links, solid center links, and more white gold objectively with the oyster bracelet than you would get with the president makes this a hefty piece on the wrist. And again, the power of the black dial and the white metal makes this a universally appealing watch. It's hard not to love a face like that, especially when it gives you what that Cellini just did, individuality, but the individuality here comes with a loomed dial and 100 meter water resistance. The Cellini is neither loomed nor more than 50 meters water resistant, so this would be my choice. Plus, you get the universal complication, day-date, which, well, effectively, can anchor every single day's memos, letters, and emails, because every time I have a watch without a date, I miss it, and the day allows you to one-up. Okay. Turning to a brand that rarely gets much discussion on this channel, and I'm bringing one of the exemplars of its recent production, Tag Heuer probably gets too little credit for what it does right at this point. The brand has been so run down on Fora, as well as watch club chit chatter, I really feel like we need to reconsider the value proposition of a watch like this under five grand. This is the Jack Heuer 80th anniversary Hoyer Carrera. Note the absence of tag branding. Technique d'avant-garde gets short shrift here as the branding is Hoyer on the dial, Hoyer on the crown, Hoyer on the clasp, and on the case back, it's Hoyer. Well, Jack Hoyer. The signature of the man who was the last family steward of the Hoyer brand and today is the patriarch of the Hoyer company. 
3,000 pieces for 2012 to mark Jack's 80th birthday. You can see the family coat of arms as well as his red lacquered signature. Now, this is a Carrera that is genuinely considered to be a motorsport inflected watch. It is truly that, with the chronograph, the tachymeter, and Hoyer's real history of timing motorsports events prior to the Tag Hoyer era. So the watch is authentic in that respect, but it's also 100 meters water resistant, so it's swimmable. And at about 49 millimeters lug to lug, this watch is surprisingly wearable on a small wrist. It's because the bracelet is pivoted. You can see how I can pull that bracelet straight down so it's not going to fight or flare across a small wrist. This is a small wrist friendly 41 that has a wide wingspan thanks to those distinctive Carrera lugs, but it's not a big bully and I can recommend this one gasp for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters in circumference despite the 49 millimeter lug to lug span. I also love the use of the panda dial and the twin register rather than the tri register for beautiful bilateral symmetry and the tricolor of silver, anthracite, and red just pops. This is timeless. If Jack makes it to 180, this watch will be just as handsome when he does. And I'm pulling for it. Now, speaking of independence, we're going to keep coming back to them throughout the episode. Rescence is one of my favorites. I go back and forth over which independent truly is my favorite, but this one is in the running. The folks from Belgium, who manufacture in Switzerland, have given us this Type 1. Type 1 Ruthenium. 42 millimeters in grade 5 titanium. The watch features an appurtenance inherited from the Type 1 squared. It is a case back lever that makes winding and setting so much easier. It even makes it easier for me to demonstrate this unusual planetary dial regulator system. Now what you have here is a regulator that separates minutes from seconds from hours with a day of the week indicator. So you can see, I'm going to turn it as it moves, the day of the week indicator essentially lets you know where you sit in the seven day period. So the two clear or unshaded days are respectively Saturday and Sunday, and then you have the remainder. The dial is made of what would conventionally be described as German silver in a longer watch, but it is then ruthenium coated and satin grained to create the gorgeous finish that you see on this one. The watch is very much like a bubble as the sapphire domes dramatically above the dial base, and you can see the dial is entirely flush. The reverse side of the case shows you that you can wind this watch manually and set using the case back, but it is an automatic watch powered by an ETA 2A242 in the highest grade. Now, the timepiece is part of a brand that makes less than 500 watches a year, so exclusivity is assured, and I would say it wears a lot like a wire lug Rodimir. It's pancake flat, 11.5 millimeters thick, 42 in broad. The lugs do stretch almost 50 millimeters across the wrist, but they're almost an imaginary presence. The size of the watch is effectively the 42 of the case, so the lugs just string the strap out over your wrist. Feather light made of titanium and sapphire. This is a timepiece for those who want something truly different. Not just a rare watch, but a brand that has entirely rethought the sense of how you tell and how you measure time. Okay, sticking with our independent theme, it's easy to forget that Oris is that. Launched in the 80th anniversary of Oris's pointer date, this is the Oris Big Crown Pro Pilot pointer date 80th anniversary edition. 40 millimeters in bronze, the timepiece pays tribute to 80 years of the Oris pointer date, which debuted in 1938. The dial is a lovely olive drab military style with a nostalgic railroad style track outboard for minutes and seconds, and a red varnished lunette indicator for the radial date. Now the watch features cathedral style 1930s inspired pilot hands. You can see the namesake Big Crown. Note that the bezel is dropped below the crests of the lugs to make the watch thinner, and you can see this one's all in satin finish. The standard version of this watch in steel features polished case blanks, and I prefer this look. Now there's a coined bezel, another nod to aviator watch style of the 1930s, and when you turn it over you can see the Salida SW200 that's used as the base for the movement. 38 hour power reserve, quick set date, hacking seconds thanks to the screw down crown and 50 meter water resistance. I'm going to call this one surface swimmable without any reservations. And you can see there are pull tabs so you can easily remove the strap if you like to swap straps without risking your skill against the lugs vis-a-vis -a, -vis a strap tool or a screwdriver. Throw it on the wrist and the watch is about 
49 millimeters lug to lug, so it's broad for a 40 millimeter case, but it's still wearable. And the lug shape matters. You can see the curvature makes this one fit snug and hunker down on a smaller wrist. So even though it's a 40, I'm gonna say 13 and a half centimeters is the lower limit to wear this watch on your wrist. Now, going way up the price spectrum, this is a very traditional chronograph, and one might even say, sometimes you have to step back to step forward. I prefer the Patek Philippe 5070 here in rose gold to any modern manual wind Patek Philippe chronograph. Yes, even the 5370 split. This watch is graceful, broad, and flat. At 42 millimeters, it was a giant by the standards of the 1998 Basel Fair when it debuted. But at 47 millimeters, lug to lug, anyone can wear this watch on the wrist as a 42. You could see some aesthetic gymnastics were enjoined in order to disguise the disparity between case size and movement size. But the double scale has become a signature of this much sought model. Now, the rose gold model was made from 2004 to 2008. So with approximately 250 per metal per year, of the 5070 manufactured, you know that the world population of these is only about 1,000 watches. So you could see the profile of the lugs. The first thing I look at when shopping pre-owned 5070s, look for the fluting on the shoulder of the lugs, because that's the first thing that goes when these are refinished. This watch is effectively virgin rose gold, so all the scratches and scuffs from its past life are on it, but it's been treated well, and it's never been exposed to the refinisher's wheel. Now turn it all over and this is where things get red hot. This is the Lemania 2310 doing business as the Patek Philippe CH2770. You could see it is a lateral clutch column wheel chrono. Get super close, Andrew. Overcoil hairspring, enormous balance that is almost, well, it's almost half the diameter of the movement it is almost the radius of the movement. You could see the Geneva hallmark ducking out from under the shadow of the flange of the case back, a free sprung gyromax style balance with an overcoil, a big slow beat chronograph with a wonderful stutter across the dial. I love a big chronograph with a slow beat because the extended chronograph hand reminds me of a pocket watch. Keep that thought handy. This is an immaculately finished watch from a series that was limited by the supply of Lemania movements as well as the generally lower Patek Philippe production of the 90s and the 2000s compared to today. The manufacturer movement 5170 has been built orders of magnitude more numerous than this watch and you could see the depth of that Lemania based caliber. Now where do we go from there? How about we cool off with a watch that's just too cool for school, from a man who would say the same of himself. But F.P. Journe's hubris is justified. He's done it all. And for the 30th anniversary of his first pocket watch, he launched this, the 30th anniversary tourbillon, affectionately known by Journe collectors as the T30. 99 pieces for 2013. The watch is 40 millimeters with a combination of rose gold. And if you look carefully on the case flank and the case back, True rose lathe turned guilloche sterling silver. Now, no two of these will be exactly alike because of the way the silver tarnishes over time. Sterling silver is approximately 6% copper, and that is why sterling silver ages and patinas, whereas pure silver would be completely inert. Now, you'll note this one is 36. There were 99 made. The dial recaps the design of F. P. Journe's original watch, his 1983 pocket watch, the first watch he made himself. And you can see some of his modern styling features, such as the bolts on the dial side, but this is strictly traditional, as Journe based his own watches in that era after the designs of Breguet. Continuing the pocket watch theme on the case back, twin mainspring barrels in parallel, manual wind, and finished and styled like that first pocket watch, this is the largest tourbillon carriage you will find on a Journe watch. Look at the size of those fired blued screws. Look at the black polished caps of the half bridges bearing the mainspring barrels. Look at the open pocket watch style architecture with a hidden drivetrain for the tourbillon. Now the tourbillon beats away at 21.6. It is enormous. It has an overcoil made by hand. And you'll note that the carriage itself, which is a twin spoke, has been completely rounded and black polished. The finish on the bridge 
bridges and the plates is frosted, and you could see that there's a handsome beveling on the edge of the bridges, but this is strictly traditional by F. P. Journe, number 36 of 99, and at only about 11 and a half millimeters thick and 40 millimeters in diameter. This is a watch anyone can wear. The lugs are nicely shaped for a small wrist. This is the brass ring of F. P. Journe wristwatch collecting. Now there are some like the T10, which was a 10-piece limited edition version of this watch that are more exclusive, but that watch is rather cool and lacks the charisma of the sterling and rose combination. I really don't believe short of a jade tourbillon or one of the first series subscription watches, you can find something much more compelling from F.P. Journe with a spinning escapement. I love this watch, and that is not something I will say of most Journe watches or of Jorn himself. No one at Watchbox is more openly and earnestly critical of F.P. Jorn and Montre Jorn, but I will say some incredible things. Hail from La Rue de Synagogue in Geneva. Okay, let's talk about the Valet de Jeu one more time. Jeger Le Coult with a Reverso. I couldn't do a JLC heavy episode without a Reverso. This is the Reverso Tribute Moon. It has a radial pointer style date, a moon phase, the time in one time zone, and the time with AM-PM in another time zone. 49 millimeters from lug to lug, 30 millimeters wide, and 10.9 millimeters thick. This uses a JLC manufactured caliber 853 manual wind, and the fun thing about this one is that you can actually set that second time zone without any need for a pusher adjuster. Turn it all over, and you simply adjust using the incremental trigger on the flank. So you no longer need a push adjuster, and there's no marring push adjuster on the flank. They have just one rather than two, and that used for setting the complication. Now the watch on the wrist is surprisingly accommodating because JLC changed the case back shape in 2016 for the 85th anniversary of the Reverso. They added a little bit of a camber or a curvature to the case back to make it easier to wear. Another change for that year was the elimination of the traditional perlage on the chassis and the arrival of a sunburst localized on approximately the 8 o'clock flank of the dial. Now if you get close to the dial you'll also note that the dial features applique blued indices and a lovely frost finish. I'm going to go out on a limb and say JLC does frosted finishes better than anyone else in the industry. Throw it on the wrist and it's a big one, but you can see that with pull tab spring bars and a quick release system built into the clasp, if you look carefully you can see it says push to release, push here to release. You can remove the strap using the pull tab spring bars and then you can remove the clasp using that trigger. So you can actually change the strap without any need for a tool. Throw it on the wrist and it's on the larger size for a reverso. I'm going to say you want a 17 centimeter circumference wrist or larger to wear this one with a proper proportion, but on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist it does fit well, it does feel good. You could pull it off. I just think this is a larger reverso for a larger dude. Where do we go from there? A 99-piece F.P. Journe, an 88-piece Haute Lance, and of course, only 1,000 pieces of that 5070R in the world, but 80 pieces. Now that's a true limited edition, and you wouldn't expect it from Omega. This is one of the few 2019 novelties that I've actually taken in hand. This is the Planet Ocean GMT Casamigos limited edition dedicated to George Clooney's Micro Brew Tequila brand. I know you didn't see that coming. This is also one of the most desirable Omega limited editions in a year that's simply overwhelmed with Speedmasters. This Seamaster sings. You can see a matte finish and relieved bezel. So you actually have polished ceramic indices and numerals that are raised over the satin finished ceramic base. You have a ceramic dial, not gloss finished as on other Omega watches, but with a zirconium oxide matte finish, white gold hands and indices, tri-arabics, and then you have the teal blue that matches the logo of Casamigos Tequila. 80 pieces, 45 millimeters full ceramic. The case back has been engraved and lacquered to remind you of Casamigos tequila mezcal, and of course it is a planet ocean, 600 meters water resistant, and thanks to the ceramic, just a little bit more wearable with less mass on the wrist. This thing is murdered out, and I actually love it. I'm not a huge planet ocean fan, and I think Omega watches need to start getting thinner and soon, but this is a watch that I genuinely adore for its rarity and its exquisite details. This is an Omega limited edition that is likely to remain one of the most exclusive and memorable in perpetuity. Omega just does not do 80-piece limited editions often. Now, 
speaking of special, have I forgotten any watch? Because this has to be, this has to be the finisher. Okay, folks, this might be the coolest watch I've ever had on the show. Danny Govberg's personal pocket watch, which he is now offering, is a vintage 47 millimeter yellow gold Hunter case back Patek Philippe Louis the 14th hand. Let me change its mode because this is a multi mode. Chronograph. Split second. And not only do I have a split second chronograph system, look at those yellow gold Louis XIV hands, by the way. Look at the fleur de lis counterweight on the end of the second hand. Look at that enamel dial. But that is not the best part of this watch. Change the mode. We're going to get maximum effect here. This watch even feels special to set. This is gonna be cool. Okay, that was awesome. You wanna know what makes it even better? Remember, I told you, it's a hunter. And you can see that extraordinary Patek Philippe split second minute repeating caliber. The movement in this watch is bigger than a Rolex Datejust. Heck, it might be bigger than a Rolex Datejust 2. The timepiece is in incredible condition. Dial, movement, and case. Of all the watches on the table tonight, this is the one I want most. If you've got the bones, call us, it's available. And I should mention everything on the table is available. We get questions about watches that are here but not posted. If it's here and you're watching it weekend of, all these watches are available. Give a call to my friends George, Brian, Jason. They're all standing by. And all of these watches are waiting for you at thewatchbox.com. Thanks so much. Thanks to you. Thanks to my new friend. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on. Yeah.